Okay, so hello everyone and a warm welcome to this special UNFPA sponsored session. Uh, this is the research leader session, reaping the benefits of demographic dividend in India, challenges, opportunities, and policy options. India, as you know, is a young country. The median age is currently 29. In 2011, it was 24. And in 2036, it will be 35. So really, India is going through a youthful bulge, bulge and this has huge implications for the country. It is said, India must grow richer and healthier and more educated and skilled before it grows older. India's demographic dividend is what we are going to discuss. How big is the window? Has the peak window passed? There are several policy interpretations or the peak is about to come. Where are the different states of India? How have we taken advantage of the dividend so far? And what we should do now? What are the policy options? So discuss, to discuss all of these questions, I will have a great eminent panel today and I will turn to them. And let me introduce my panelists one by one. First of all, we'll have Sridham Haridas, uh, representative of UNFPA India ad interim, who will make some intro remarks. Uh, if I can have the bio of Sridham Haridas, please. Thank you. And then we will have Professor Kulkani, PM Kulkani, who will give us and introduce and unpack the concept of demographic dividend for India and the opportunities and the challenges it presents. Then we will have special remarks and comments by Professor Sonal de Desai. Uh, Professor Desai will present her thoughts on what the challenges are in reaping the benefits of the demographic dividend in India, especially from a point of view of women and girls in India's economy and society. And then to give us the way forward, we will have special remarks by Dr. Rakesh Sarwal, Additional Secretary, Niti Ayo, Government of India. We requested Dr. Sarwal to give us an assessment of how India has addressed the demographic dividend so far, which policies have worked well, <clears throat> what adjustments need to be made, what are the ways forward uh, as, as India really goes into this youthful bulge, bulge of, uh, as a country and a society and especially looking at which sectors should we focus on health, education, work, governance, and rights, and so on, without leaving anyone behind. So without further ado, I would request uh, Sri Ram Haridas to give us intro comments, please. Thank you. Over to you, Sri Ram. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Jay. I hope uh, everyone can hear me very well. Uh, good morning uh, to everyone. Very happy to be part of this panel, uh, and I can't wait to hear uh, from our experts here. We all know that uh, population dynamics, uh, encompassing issues of population growth, fertility and reproduction, mortality and mobility, uh, gender equality, aging, as well as population uh, mobility and distribution, uh, impacts virtually every sustainable development objective. Therefore, uh, as India looks to build back better from COVID-19, uh, the critical influence of population dynamics and data needs to be recognized and addressed uh, in these planning stages. Uh, the same applies for us at uh, UNFPA as well, uh, but also for the a larger UN system in the country, uh, as we are now started planning for our next five-year country program. Therefore, population dynamics and data is uh, one of our core areas of program and policy influencing. And we are keen to partner with researchers and policymakers as we move forward. Uh, within, of course, population dynamics, we at UNFPA India, uh, and if I may say, even the UN as a whole, are looking at the issue of demographic dividend very carefully uh, because of the implications on India's young population, uh, their sexual and reproductive health needs, uh, and more importantly, their human development potential and their role in economic and social development. Uh, with a population of uh, now over 1.3 billion people, there are, of course, many challenges facing India, uh, including coping up with the current public health emergency. Now we have a new variant as well, uh, creating more jobs, managing macroeconomic shocks, and mitigating uh, climate change. But India also has a hidden asset. Uh, I mean, I should actually say uh, not very hidden anymore, uh, which is what Jai also talked about. Uh, it's young demographic profile. India is the world's youngest country, 
Uh, and we have heard the Honorable Prime Minister repeatedly saying that he wants India to focus on harnessing the demographic dividend to unleash India's true potential. We all know that the demographic dividend offers a fundamentally different way of viewing the prospects and pathways for sustainable development in countries like India with the high proportions of young people. Uh, expanded investment in empowerment, including in sexual reproductive health and reproductive rights and quality education for adolescent and youth, especially uh, girls, have lifelong effects. And when such investment, uh, investments extend broadly across the population, they result in a surge of human capital. Uh, when this surge actually coincides with the demographic bulge of young people owing to declining fertility, like we are seeing in India, the result is an especially high proportion of the population with better health uh, and more education moving into its most productive years. So if these young people are met with real opportunities for decent work, the demographic dividend of accelerated development can be reaped uh, in the course of even say in one generation. But of course, actualizing this vision demands an integrated approach to development policy, linking health and rights, skill development and the labor market, social investment in young people and especially girls. So today I'm really eager to hear from all the experts uh, present here on how we can make these institutional changes and foster the partnerships necessary to deliver such an integrated approach so that India can reap the demographic dividend. Hence, I'm looking forward to this session with a lot of excitement and expectation. Uh, from my side, uh, before I finish, I pledge the support of UNFPA in this journey as we try to implement the demographic dividend roadmap on how we can ensure that India and its states are able to maximize these efforts in order to realize the hopes of uh, India's young people uh, and fulfill their aspirations for better life. I'll, I'll stop with that. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Sriram. That's really well, well said, and the stage is well set, that where are we going with such a large budget of youthful population? So thank you very much for those introductory remarks and to pledge that UNFP is going down this road with uh, various partnerships in place. Professor Kulkarni, now if I can turn to you and really ask you to unpack the concept of demographic dividend for us. What does it look like for India? Um, where are the different states? Have we missed the bus? Or is there a peak coming in terms of an opportunity forward? So if you're ready, then Professor Kulkarni, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it's uh, given a challenging task and not easy to address all the questions. But at the outset, I am thankful to the IUSSP and the UNFPA for this opportunity to share some of my results and share some of my concern in the context of the demographic dividend for India. At the outset, now we know fairly well and we know it from the work of, uh, shall we? Uh, okay. We know from the work of Bloom and colleagues that if there is rapid fertility decline, the share of young age population falls, that of working age rises substantially yielding the demographic dividend. This is now very fairly known everywhere. The dividend is available for a period of time, the window of demographic opportunity, because after some time, the share of old age population also rises. And the dividend is an opportunity and can be beneficial only if the labor force participation and the productivity of labor are high. Next, Next please. Shall I move the slides, sir? Okay, thank you. Now, when does the dividend accrue? We can get into some technical thing. When can we say, what is the cutoff for dividend? We can say the beginning to accrue when the share of working age population is relatively high. Now, commonly, it has been taken 15 to 16, four years as working ages, but with modernizing economies, it would be appropriate to treat 20 to 64 years as working ages. If the share of this group is relatively high or above normal at a point time point, we can say window of demographic opportunity may be said to be open. But what is this normal level? Now, it has been seen that share of this age group in a stationary population with life expectancy in the 70s is about 57%. We can take that as a normal. When the share is above this, we can say dividend is likely to accrue. In terms of dependency ratio, this is 75%. And thus when dependency ratio is below 75%, we can say dividend would accrue. Next, Next please. What is the situation in India? 
India has experienced notable for decline in the recent decades. And data show that it has reached below replacement fertility in 2017 itself. The age distribution is becoming older. Demographic dividend has begun to accrue. But in India, demographic transition has varied spatially with the southern region and parts of other regions ahead in transition and the central region lagging in the demographic transition. And as a consequence of this, the degree and timing of the dividend are also likely to vary regionally. Next one. We have results. Next slide, slide please. Okay. Now, these are the results from the UN projections, the medium variant of UN projections. And we can see that the orange curve for India dependency ratio shows that it has already fallen below 75%. So we're already into dividend. This would reach a peak around 2040 or so and the dividend will end, the window will close around 2017. Now, for comparison or showing contrast, I also presented figures for China. And you can see China began to gain dividend much before India did. It would also lose dividend much before India would lose around 2040. And the peak for China is much better. That is, China had a much lower dependency ratio of about 51%, whereas for India, it would the lowest would be about 60%. So, the Ch China would draw very high dividend at particular time. Next. Next, please. But this picture is for India. Since the states are different levels of transition, the timings would vary. And therefore, we need to have projections for states for a long period to see regional variation in dividend. The UN projections are for India and not for states. In India, the technical group has provided projections, but only up to 36. And therefore, fresh projections were carried out for 22 large states of India. And in this, four phases of dividend are identified. Phase one, yet to get dividend. Dependency ratio is still too high. Phase two, getting dividend and dependency ratio falling. So increase in dividend. Phase three, getting dividend, but dependency ratio rising. So we are away from the bottom. And finally, phase four means dividend is no longer available. The ratio has now again, go above 75 Next. Now, these are the trends shown, the projected trends in the dependency ratio. Instead of states, I have presented these for regions because picture becomes very messy for states. But we can see here that for India, the dividend has begun to accrue and it will continue for some time. For Southern states, it has begun to accrue much earlier and will continue for up to say 2060 or so. But for the central state, it has yet to begin to accrue. It will begin to accrue only in this present decade, but it will continue for a longer period. The southern regions is, is the one where demographic transition has been lag lagging, which has been lagging in the transition. Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan also. Next. For states now, I've tried to present a picture of the phases of demographic transition. And we can see that states like Tamil Nadu, Kerala, well ahead in demographic transition, have already been getting huge dividend, but their dividend will run out sometime after 2050 with a peak in this decade itself. Other Southern states, Western and Eastern states have also been getting dividend. Their dividend will reach a peak around 2030 or 40, and they will run out of this by 2060-70. The states in the central region have yet to begin to get dividend, but they will start gradually now they will enter the phase of dividend and the dividend there will last for a longer period going almost towards the end of the century. And this is how we can see how things are phased. As a result, basically states lagging in transition would enter the phase in the 2020s and gradually lose the dividend much later. But at any time point during 2000 and 2080, the states would be in different dividend phases some would be in rising, some would be in declining phases or waxing and waning phases. And as a consequence, at no point would the dividend be very high. The dependency ratio is projected to go down to only 60% in contrast to a very low value of 51% for China. But it would last for a longer period. Thus, India would draw moderate dividend for a long period. And now we look at actual size of the working age population rather than share of the work because dividend 
uh, is decided based on the share, but we need to look at actual share to see what would be the labor increases or declines. And we can see now from this graph, and this is done for 22 large states, for almost all the states, the size of working age population will increase in the, up to 2030 or so. So all of them are gaining. But after 2030, most of the states outside the central region will lose working age population. There will be a decline in the size of the working age population. Whereas those in the central region, those states lagging in the dividend will continue to add to the working age population. As a result, there will be huge imbalance. Some states losing working age population, some states gaining. This looks at natural increase, of course. And what would be the consequence of this is some next slide, please. Next slide. That we would have huge regional imbalances. Of course, after 2060, there would be decline in the size of working age population throughout. But up to that, especially between 2030 and 60, there would be some states gaining working age population and some states losing working age population. And an obvious or likely consequence of this would be massive interstate migration from states gaining working age population to states losing working age population. Next slide, please. Next, please. So what are the opportunities and challenges this provides, particularly for India, because the regional variations, interstate variations are very important for India, which may not be the case for many countries, though some other countries also would have similar situation. First of all, India would not get a very high dividend as say China at any time. This seems like a relative disadvantage. However, a moderate dividend lasting for a longer time allows the economy to accommodate the rising working age population in the labor force relatively more easily. On the other hand, the phases of dividend vary spatially. The advantage spread over time and space can be obtained only through large interstate regional or inter-regional migration. Otherwise, this would not be a benefit. But we know that long distance and interstate migrants face various problems, family separation, since often only men migrate, language barriers, difficulties in accessing social services, including health, education, food security, and the place of destination. Next, Next please. Besides, large-scale migration brings in political issues at the place of destination because often people resist the flow inflow of migrants. And therefore, it must be ensured that the process of migration is smooth, the migrants adapt to the place of destination, can access health and educational services and other benefits at the place of destination, and overcome difficulties of language. But to design policies for this, we need to have availability of data on migration patterns, migration streams, and conditions of migrants at regular intervals. To sum up, in addition to the well-recognized issues of creation of employment, labor force participation, investments in education and skill developments to harvest the demographic dividend. Programs also need to be introduced, particularly in India, to address issues concerning interstate and interregional migration of labor so that the demographic dividend is efficiently harvested. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kulkarni. Thank you for laying it out so clearly that the, the, the demographic dividend has started, has begun to accrue. We hear you very well on the interstate variations and the issue of migration and for laying it out so clearly that we may not have a big dividend like China, uh, but a smaller one, but a more prolonged one, which may be actually good for us in the longer run if the policies are designed appropriately. So, so the really, thanks so much, uh, Professor Kulkarni. Uh, we should revisit some of this, uh, the macro picture that you gave us. And now I, as a Desai, uh, to take a particular look actually on something that has been written about so much that India's female workforce participation is going down. Women are dropping out of work for various reasons. And the data shows there's quite a sharp fall actually from 34% to a decade and a half back to 12% and it's gone up slightly again to 18%.
But to give all of that and uh, you know challenges and opportunities to go deeply from a gender lens, from a women's and girls' perspective, uh, but also other aspects, Professor Desai, we are very keen to hear from you. So if you're ready, it is over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I'm probably going to lose my membership in the union of card-carrying demographers because I'm not about to present any statistics at all. Luckily, Professor Kulkarni has done an absolutely fantastic job of laying out the magnitude of changes in age distribution and dependency ratios so that I can afford to focus on scenarios for managing it. Let's focus on three possible scenarios. Call them debt, deposit, and dividend. The first scenario, which I would call debt, is the one in which we, we do nothing. Families enjoy having fewer children to care for. They enjoy life. If they are middle class, they buy a car. If they are poor, they can aspire to motorbike. Government does nothing and takes the savings from having to educate fewer children, building schools and paying teachers to reduce current deficit, maybe even increase the salary of government servants. 30 years down the line, we suddenly discover that the party is over and we must find ways of caring for this aging population. Parents discover that traditional forms of social security, living with their sons are not easily available. Since 25% of the two child families will have no sons, 50% will need to take a chance on living that their at least one living son is you know, filial enough to take care of them. Only 25% will have two sons to choose from. Governments will discover that aging population brings healthcare expenditure they did not anticipate, while the taxpayer base declines. I would hope that all of us are smart enough to avoid that. The second scenario is a deposit where we anticipate incipient aging and try to make sure that the older parents don't have to rely on goodwill of their sons and daughters-in-law. We would still rely on children to care for their parents, but we make sure the gender norms do not make it impossible for girls to support their own parents and parents would feel no shame for taking help from their children. Legal framework for property ownership would be modified so that parents can hold on to their property securely uh, without the kind of constraints that are placed uh, by law around governance of property inherited through things like Hindu United Family. Uh, government would develop a social security program in which old age pensions would be generous and health insurance programs would reduce healthcare burdens. I should, I'm actually hopeful about that in the sense that we have already begun to put in place many of these programs such as the old age pension security, pension program uh, and um, health insurance programs. However, we might need to think about improving their allocation, uh, enhancing delivery and so on. Third scenario, however, the scenario that we all hope for that uh, Dr. Kulkarni mentioned is the one of dividend where we say that, okay, we have savings at family and society level, but let's invest them wisely to secure economic conditions that bring India to a totally different level of socioeconomic development. To do this, families would need to invest in their children's education and society will need to ensure that schools de deliver high quality education. Skill building combined with investments in industries that use these skills would provide high yield and high value jobs. Let me not belabor these issues since I hope that uh, Shri Sarwal will speak about these issues. But let me instead focus on things that would prevent us from attaining a high rate of demographic dividend. Let me focus on two areas in which uh, we might constrain ourselves from achieving the heights that we seek. The first has to do with gender and the second with social and regional inequality. Women's labor force participation in India, as Jay just mentioned, remains low and by many accounts is declining. One of the best ways of reducing dependency ratio is to enhance uh, the number of workers. 
And yet, by not harnessing women's labor power, uh, we are restricting uh, the uh, demographic dividend that we could harness. We would normally expect that rising education and declining fertility would lead to increase in women's participation, as it has done for other countries. Not so for India. In India, uh, educated and low fertility women actually have lower work participation rates than their less advantaged sisters. Um, for women, uh, work most of the work available often tends to be on family farms and in family businesses, uh, which educated women often don't seek. They are looking for very different kind of work. A man with 12 class education can be a driver, a postman, an auto mechanic. None of these occupations welcome women. Women with high school education are stuck to being uh, a and or Anganwadi workers and the number of government jobs are limited. Even vocational training for women seems to focus on beauty parlor uh, and beautician jobs. And I suspect that the number of parlors that uh, a rural Indian village can support are quite limited in number. Moreover, we also need to ensure that our young women have a chance to build a career before their marriage. Uh, NFHS data shows that um, fertility has fallen rap uh, rapidly. However, age at marriage has moved only marginally, allowing women to find space uh, to uh, and time to develop an attachment to work before getting married and having a child may increase their long-term uh, work attachment. Now, I should add here, okay, that uh, the, uh, efforts are being made and some of them are quite successful. Uh, Manrega program that offers job opportunities to women uh, actually has great success rates as we have seen in the past. Uh, so programs of that type have definitely tremendous value, but we perhaps need to think more holistically about increasing jobs for women in high skill and high returns kind of uh, jobs rather than in a sort of more of manual positions. The third issue that we need to remember from a gender perspective is that uh, the issue of women's aging is far more critical to think about than men's aging. Women have few independent sources of income. They don't have pensions, they don't have assets which makes it very difficult for them to support themselves in old age. Can we really expect women with no assets and no claims to social security or at least the pensions and gratuity to live as happily uh, and um, live a healthy and productive life as senior citizens as men? Thinking about women's aging is perhaps a really crucial thing that for us to focus upon as we go along. The second aspect of demographic dividend is the recognition that our lives are interlinked over generations. The generational economy of fertility decline suggests that working age adults in any generation will come from groups with high fertility and older population will come from groups with low fertility. This is pretty analogous to what Professor Kulkarni just explained that uh, states like Kerala and Tamil Nadu would experience aging before states like Bihar, Odisha, and uh, Uttar Pradesh. Thus, um, in order to fully reap the demographic dividend, we actually need to invest in health, education, and skill building for children from these uh, states and uh, uh, sections of society, which we now tend to consider as demographic laggards because this is where our future of the workforce is going to come from. We live in an interconnected nation and without investing in sections of our society that have been left behind, our interest rate on demographic dividend would be far more meager than we would like to see. I think we have to think about uh, Sabka Saath and Sabka Utkarsh as a motto rather than just focusing on um, demographic dividend in, a, uh, in an abstract sense. Thank you very much. Namaste. Namaste, thank you. Wow, that was so enlightening.
You've, uh, thank you, thank you, Professor Desai. You've given us so many dimensions connecting women and the demographic dividend and made it come alive. Uh, thank you, especially resonated your comment about, you know, what does a girl who has cleared class 10 do apart from the traditional notions of skill building that we have? And, and I look at the NFHS numbers, uh, about 41% of women now have completed class 10 uh, years of education, and that has got a bearing on so many other aspects. So truly, you've given us so much to think about. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Desai. I would now move on to the policy uh, and ways forward. The stage has been set, the challenges have been outlined, uh, the timing is perfect. So Dr. Sarwal, we would like to bring you in, additional secretary, Niti Ayo. You've been uh, championing a lot of these issues uh, on human development, on nutrition and health and education. So we are very keen to hear from you, Dr. Sarwal, on the ways forward. Over to you, Dr. Sarwal, when you're ready. Thank, thank you. you, Jay. Uh, let me at the outset thank uh, the International Union for the Scientific Study of Populations, as well as the Indian Association for the Study of Populations and UNFPA for giving me this opportunity and for inviting uh, me uh, at the seminar. I'm really delighted and enlightened by the address of Professor Kolkarni and Professor Desai. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, uh, the demographic dividend represents an immense opportunity which is time barred and which has to be capitalized during this time period in order to become an asset rather than become a liability as Professor Desai mentioned. Um, I would also stress that uh, while we have had immense attention, given immense attention to human resource development over the last decades, last two decades particularly, reflected in the right to education, the, uh, the health, national health mission initially, now the PMJAY, the health and wellness centers, and an intense amount of uh, attention has gone to building the demographic uh, dividend, uh, the benefit of demographic dividend in terms of developing human capital. Uh, but the problem has not been looked at from the perspective what it is being presented now in this conference, because it has a time element to it. It's not going to last for long, and we have to capitalize, we have to use it in this time. And secondly, the convergent value of health, education, women's empowerment, fertility, employment, and skills, the need to converge them. I think these are the two key takeaways from this conference. And uh, on these lines, I think there's need for an action plan and to address the question in a very systematic manner, uh, which we as uh, Niti, the government and society uh, in a holistic approach need to take it forward. Um, uh, that is the learning and I compliment the organizers for bringing attention to this particular topic in this fashion. But having said that, let us note that the NFHS 5 does bring out the successes of the effort that the governments have been doing in the past two decades, and particularly the last five, six, six years. In terms of population and household profile, our access to electricity, access to drinking water and sanitation services, clean cooking fuels, all of that has seen a dramatic rise. Our births registered have also seen a rise. 90% of our births are now registered. Uh, the new education policy, the National Education Policy 2020, brings in an element of early childhood education, which is three to six years, which is the time uh, where brain development takes place. And that, along with proper nutrition and health, is going to make an immense difference, immense improvement and quantum jump in the ability of our children, as well as the growing and the young population. Incidentally, NFHS 5 says children less than five years who attended pre-primary school uh, had started, this number has started as 13.6% in NFHS 5. So greater attention is being given to early childhood education. I think one of the success stories in Indian case has been the decline, the rapid decline in child mortality as well as maternal mortality. Um, the, decline, the recent um, SRS, SRS data tells us that it is 30, uh, the infant mortality is 30, uh, which, uh, and the maternal mortality is 113, which has been uh, consistent with the SDG targets and it's, it's a real success story, something that we all as Indians need to be proud of. And this has been achieved uh, through a host of measures, including not, um, not the least, uh, better access to contraception, like the um, access, any modern methods, the access has increased from 47 to 
and the unmet need has come down from 13% to 9.4%. So uh, the host of measures in terms of immunization, weighing at birth, institutional deliveries, skilled birth attendance, um, and uh, early childhood education care, all those indicators have shown a quite a large increase during this time period. Now, having said that, I think uh, the point which is uh, being made out and which is very important is no one left behind until we reach the last of the families, the last of the child with all the services, the, the average indicators are going to be going to be drawn downward. And in that regard, I think an entitlement based approach, a saturation based approach, which our prime minister has been talking for each of these services is the need of the hour. So that we just don't count uh, in terms of who all have been covered, but, but we target, we proactively target all those who have been left out. So I think that is the learning um, from uh, the focus on demographic dividend and the success and the gaps that our NFHS 5 presents. So having said that, I'll run through a few slides. Uh, if you could, yeah, next please. Yeah. So uh, this is a very interesting graph, Professor Lee. Um, we are borrowing it from Professor Lee, which on the y-axis shows the percentage of GDP which is contributed by demographic dividend. And of course, on the x-axis is the time bar. Now, uh, we can see that countries like South Korea, China, Vietnam, and even Thailand had a huge proportion of their GDP growth rate contributed by demographic dividend. In India, the demographic dividend started in 70s, peaked sometime in uh, maybe uh, 1819, and would continue for a longer time. So this graph tells us that we are not utilizing our demographic dividend to the extent other Asian peers have done so, that there is a huge scope of at least doubling it up, as, as well as benefit from the longer period for which we have the demographic dividend. Next, please. Uh, this again is a very simplistic, but a very clear presentation of how the, uh, the benefits of demographic dividend come out. That is the working age population, 16 to 64, when they earn and they save by being in the labor market, they compensate more than compensate for the consumption of the rest of the population, particularly the dependent population, the early age ones and the elderly ones. So. Uh, the, the options are very clear. It is to increase, as Dr. Sonaldi said, increase the proportion of the population, which is the labor force, particularly women, which has particularly come down in India by giving various opportunities for women to be employed, as well as increasing the productivity of labor, which is through better skills, uh, both um, in terms of um, early skilling and um, add-on skilling, as well as provide opportunities through both self-employment and wage employment where their skills could lead to productive employment. So it's, 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 it's a fairly simplistic way, but a very clear way of uh, targeting what needs to be done in order to get the benefits of demographic dividend. And many of our policies are in this regard, but I think convergent approach is what we need to do. Uh, the use of another beautiful idea of national transfer accounts, Professor Lee um, is the champion in this, is again a very, very very simple, but a very clear way of telling us as to how the country is spending its resources, public and private, in which age group these resources are being spent and where the productive, um, productive income is coming from. So the NTA of our country uh, have been prepared, I think for two, 2011, and um, that is the last data for the NSS which was available, but we need to update it uh, with the available data as well as prepare it for all the states so that state tailored actions and policies can be put in place. As again, Professor Desai mentioned that the labor surplus states are the ones where skilling is required, where the, where the migration is going to take place. But I think NTA state-wise is a target that we must do as a government and as a society so that we can identify exactly where the opportunity lies and where the benefits can be taken from. Next, please. Uh, now, the, uh, the, in terms of intervention, I think uh, the, uh, the options and the sectors are clearly well-defined. It's uh, about making children healthy, children educated and skilled, providing them productive employment, the governance systems which encourage um, productive employment as well as dignified work, 
uh, respect for migrants and adequate care for the migrants, as well as a rights-based approach. Next, please. So we went around and saw uh, what is it that the experience of other Asian countries or Asian peers tells us in each of these sectors. And that is what uh, I propose to present here. Now, uh, if we see case of Singapore, uh, Korea for that matter, instead of universal education, they focused on skilling so that uh, uh, the children gain these skills which are in demand, which, can, which they can productively employ. And uh, I think that is where um, our education needs to be headed towards. And uh, the innovation missions, the Atal Innovation Missions, the Atal Tinkering Labs is a step uh, in the right direction. And we need to scale it up so that uh, the real focus on productive employment is done through skilling, innovation, and, and as well as funding for these, uh, these new ideas and opportunities. Next, please. In terms of workforce, we know that our women labor force participation is quite low, around 20. We also know that the women who are in the household, particularly the educated women, the skilled women, present an untapped opportunity, uh, which is uh, hidden because of, which is underutilized because of social mooring, social norms, and the availability of employment opportunities. So we as a society need to encourage the mobility of women, the employment of women, um, the, um, the, as other countries have done, like South, South Korea example we are giving over here, legally, legally compulsory gender budgeting to analyze the gender disaggregated data and its impact on policies and increasing childcare benefits, as well as boosting tax incentives for part-time work and social norms and positive attitude have also helped. So it's partly behavior, it is attitude of the society. So that's why I said it's a whole of society approach. We as a country have to labor and work towards these goals, of course, led by the policies that the government puts in. Next, please. In terms of health, uh, while the investment, the amount invested in health is critically important, but how it is spent and how it is translated into gains on the ground is equally important. Our health expenditure has risen gradually. And uh, it's heartening to know that uh, not only the National Health Policy of 2017, but also the 15 Finance Commission have recommended 2.5% of um, the GDP and 8% of the government expenditure should be spent on health by the states, two thirds of it in any case being contributed by the state governments. So as we move along, we have uh, made timelines as well as uh, projections on how much the center and the state need to increase on health. So we hope that not only uh, the utilization, but the resources available for health will increase so as to invest uh, in the early, ch early childhood and the mother and the child and the women and the children uh, segment. Um, the focus on family planning, uh, making choices available, again, uh, is very important. We have seen gains in this, as I just mentioned from MNFHS5, there is tremendous scope for improvement. Social marketing of contraceptives, is a huge success story in India that needs to be replicated all over the country. Um, and that again is a whole of society approach to providing services, public and private and civil society working together. Uh, protecting women's sexual and reproductive health is again a rights-based approach. We are making choices. The, the, um, the, the option of uh, making uh, choices as well as making services available as per need is a responsibility that we as a society and a government have to do. And uh, uh, the, um, the target, of course, has to be on the lower income, the, the bottom decide of the population, because that is where the biggest change in average indicators can take place if they are targeted. And therefore, universal approach and a saturated approach, to my knowledge, to my understanding, is extremely important. Next, in terms of governance, of course, all of it weaves together with a integrated metrics of uh, targeting a family for the host of interventions, which is slightly at variance with the current system of, of individual vertical schemes working together. And it is in this regard, as our COVID pandemic has shown us, the value of local self-governments, the value of uh, the city governments is extremely important, like in Kerala and Tamil Nadu uh, and various other places. We have documented this in our Niti publications. The local self-governments have been able to bring about this integration, which normally a vertical-oriented a scheme-oriented uh, government setup does not permit. So uh, I think uh, a greater role for these bodies in 
um, in seeing that there is a saturation of all the necessary services around the families, particularly the bottom, um, bottom of the pyramid families is extremely important. And in this regard, I think I'll need to remind, I remind myself and uh, all others here, the role of Gram Sabhas, the extremely important role of Gram Sabhas in an open meeting in a transparent fashion for taking collective decisions, identifying the beneficiary families and seeing who are the ones who need to be benefited first uh, is extremely relevant and extremely important. So in terms of migration, uh, the COVID pandemic has again highlighted the need for addressing the special needs of these migrants. Uh, we have brought out a publication in Niti on this respect. Uh, there are institutes in the country who are working on migration index, the migration friendliness of the state governments. And this subject has and is going to receive increasing importance when the national portal, national migration portal is also in the making. Uh, the courts have also been seized of this. So I think the issues of migration have and will gain imp great, greater importance and all this will really benefit uh, the demographic dividend story, the larger issue of demographic dividend that we are discussing here today. Uh, next, please. So at the end, I would suggest and I would submit that a rights-based approach um, is uh, the way to go uh, for all these five aspects and on the sectors uh, which can lead to a positive demographic dividend. And um, in this regard, the role of civil society, the role of our local self-government bodies at the urban and the, local and the rural uh, sector, and, uh, and empowering them in accordance with the constitutional provisions and the role for integrating the vertical delivery uh, services, which normally are delivered vertical, integrating at the household level and targeting the poorest of the poor are extremely important ways of uh, going forward. So I conclude here and thank you for the patient listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarwal. That was really enlightening. Again, taking us further on the road of this discussion. Thank you so much for your time. I know, Dr. Sarwal, you have to leave us at 12.30. So we'll try and see if there are any quick uh, follow-up comments or questions that we would like to have. Uh, but Dr. Sarwal, we hear you very clearly on the convergent value that I thought was a great point for us going forward on how do we bring fertility, gender, uh, issues of health, education, and skills together. And then again, you talked about entitlement-based approach, uh, especially leading to saturation, leaving no one behind. Uh, that is such a powerful way of approaching this. And then you also gave us uh, thoughts on how that's being done at the front line through the local governance bodies and civil society. So thank you, Dr. Sarwal, also to make the point how the allocation on health by GDP is, looking, is being looked at further increases to 2.5% of GDP. So thank you for giving us a full picture. And before I take up any more time, I was looking at the chat bar, there's, there's a question and also there is a hand from audience. So let me just see uh, if I could if I could invite a question. Um, so one is for you, Professor Kulkarni. Uh, quick question, yes. actually. It's, it's a longish one. I don't know if you've been able to yeah. see I, it. I have read it. Yes. You have read it. Okay. Yeah, that, then would you like to give us a quick answer, yes. and then yes. I would like to give us Dr. Sarwal another uh, option to come back. Thank yes. you, Professor thank, Kulkarni. Thank you. Basically, the issue is what is old. Again, it comes to dis deciding what is old. When do we say person is out of the working ages and retired or post-working ages and so on. And this could vary from region to region as health conditions improve, people who can work for longer periods. As we know in most of the Western countries now, retirement age has become 65, somewhere it is 67. And that can happen. If that happens, of course, our size of uh, working age population would increase, but there is also the other side to it at younger ages. That is why traditionally though 15 to 59 or 15 to 64 are considered working ages, I have preferred to take 20 to 64. But over time we could change it to 20 to 69 if that is uh, well accepted. Uh, we, it's not difficult, uh, not easy to do it for individuals separately. The individual's health conditions do matter. But individuals themselves do it by taking voluntary retirement, optional retirement at different ages. But for the society as a whole, changing age at retirement 
as has been requested in India, demanded in India for quite some time, is something that needs to be considered. This has been done in most of the Western countries now, 63, 65, 67. In India also, there has been changes and this could take place. That would change picture slightly, but overall pattern is not likely to change by shifting the age by two years or three years. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kulkarni. Um, looking at the time, I will uh, take up your guest question a little later, but I was also keen to have a bit of a conversation between the panelists, if I can use the next 10 minutes we have uh, with us, Dr. Sarwal, before he leaves us. Would there be any comment or conversation or question from amongst yourselves? Uh, any follow-up comments, Dr. Desai or Professor Kulkarni or uh, Ram uh, for Dr. Sarwal before he uh, has to go? Yeah, I, if I may, yeah. okay, go ahead. Okay, Professor Kulkarni, go ahead and then go ahead. Professor Kulkarni, go ahead. Uh, I, I think what uh, Sonali Desai, you know, points she brought out really are relevant, especially for female labor force participation. Where is the opportunity for female labor force participation? I guess everyone has been talking about because you know, for technical computation of dividend, people take size of the working age population, not actual number of workers. We should really mm -hmm. see how many are actual number of workers. So enhancing labor force participation within working ages is of course an issue that has been well recognized. And for India particularly, it's a female labor force party because male participation in the ages 20 to 55, 59, 20, especially 25 onwards is fairly universal. It's fairly high, but not female participation. And at some places it has in fact shown a decline. So this is an issue that needs to be addressed. And for this purpose, actually, the gender discrimination, gender stereotyping of labor and so on, that is something that has to gradually fade out. You know, it, you cannot have revolutionary changes, but gradually that has to fade out so that there is nearly equal opportunity for both men and women in all sectors of the economy and not females in certain sectors and male in certain sectors. Now, fortunately, the, with court orders and other things, even army recruitment has been open to women in the recent days, including admission to the NDA. So there have been positive changes, but these are, of course, very small at this stage, and we need really great revolutionary changes in this aspect. Thank you, Professor Kulkarni. Ram, do you want to come back with your comment and then Professor Desai, should I go, go to you? Great, great. Thanks, thanks, uh, Jai. I mean, because Dr. Rakesh Sarwal has to leave, uh, very, it was very inspiring uh, to hear from him. You know, I mean, laying out the uh, policy options uh, and also putting the emphasis on rights, you know, so that is like uh, really great to uh, hear. Just one quick question, uh, Dr. Sarwal. Uh, the fact that, you know, you have laid out those options very clear, uh, what India needs to do. Uh, are there any particular areas that you know you would want uh, the other development partners? You feel that you know you could support the uh, government of India and Niti. If there are any particular areas, that is something that you know I'd be very much uh, interested to hear. And of course, you know uh, the conversation doesn't stop here. Uh, even after the webinar is over, we would like to partner with Niti and and uh, GOI on taking this forward. Thanks. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Das. And um, I'm really you know, very appreciative of you and your team for having taken this initiative, come over and uh, got us on this uh, platform. Um, I think, uh, as I mentioned, it's a very important way of looking at the problem and the opportunity, which is not in line with the conventional scheme, project, department way of government's functioning. And uh, this is highly desirable because it focuses on results. It focuses on outcomes. Uh, ultimately, what is it that uh, an individual, enlightened individual, is given, give, able to give to the society? So uh, I think we would like to work with you further on this, develop this idea in concrete terms, as well as, as I mentioned, state-wise, uh, the national transfer accounts updated for the country, and uh, bring out concrete suggestions on how to increase both the labor force, particularly women, as well as the productivity of labor by topping up elements of our existing scheme and integrating the various schemes at the uh, at the household level by identifying the bottom of the pyramid. So we would be very happy to work with you and all developmental partners and Professor Desai and Professor Kulkarni in this matter. I welcome all of you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Great conversation. This is how 
we intended it to be. Thank you, Dr. Samal, for your comments. Professor Desai, you wanted to come. Uh, yes, I was actually really inspired by uh, uh, Shri Sarwal's comment about uh, the young children, uh, preschool, early uh, childhood education, and so on, uh, as well as the comment about the time-boundedness of some of these efforts. And it strikes me that what we need to bring into this conversation is the fact that we are just recovering, or I hope we are recovering, out of um, a pandemic, which has actually uh, had tremendous impact on um, all sections of society, but particularly children. And it seems to me that I think a couple of things we might want to think about. One is actually identify age groups which have had been particularly negatively impacted due to school closure or uh, any other sort of impacts associated with pandemic and see what catch up actions can be taken. So again, this would be a sort of a time bounded effect, but just identifying where we have seen some of the big left behind um, groups of children. For example, our work at NCAR has shown that about 9% of the children uh, um, couldn't get into the school because schools were closed. They couldn't get admission, they couldn't get admission, so they couldn't get any online learning. Okay, so it, it is that particular age group. So, you know, they, they would have been six last year, they are now seven and eight year old, and those are the ones that deserve particularly great attention. So, in some sense, um, sort of taking this pandemic lens uh, to the ongoing discussion uh, would have a tremendous impact uh, in terms of policy development as we go along. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Desai. Just uh, enriching points and we all taking notes in how both of you are suggesting ways forward, which is fantastic. Uh, Dr. Sarwal, I know you have three minutes, so if there's any final comments uh, from you, uh, we would like to thank you very much. As you, as you saw, we are very inspired. We are very um, wonderfully happy that this sort of discussion has come in the way it has actually. And thanks to your proactive sort of engagement with us in detail. Uh, so I would like to really thank you and we would like to take it from here further. Uh, thanks very much. If there are any final words or uh, comments you would like to have, please. Jay, I would, um, I would just reiterate that keep, keep the torch on, keep the headlight on. Uh, let's focus on this issue. And it is a very good perspective of, uh, of addressing uh, the needs as a family perceives it from the individual perspective, rather than from what a scheme or a department or a government functionary may want to do it. So it's a citizen's perspective. I would say it is a citizen's way and a nation's and a society way of looking at it, which is slightly different from the way conventional government works. And this is very beautifully unifying. It is uh, consolidating, it is converging, and it is target oriented and time bound. So it is everything that government wants to do, but is not able to do because of the silo approach. So keep the focus on, we are with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sarwal, we hear you and please feel free to drop out when you want to. Once again, thank, thank you. you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. I take Great, me. so we'll, thank you. And we'll move the conversation forward. Um, thank you, uh, panelists, my eminent panelists, really wonderful, Professor Desai and Professor Kulkarni, Sriram, all of you have been so good on time and your responses. So I'm just checking the chat bar again. Uh, there are two questions. Um, are you able to see them? There's one comment, of course, um, because these are long, so I don't want to read. The second question is uh, from Nandita Saikia uh, to Professor Desai. Uh, despite having many laws for gender equality in India, say property inheritance, revolutionary, revolutionary changes have not happened how government can collaborate with the civil society to change this law? I think it's a powerful question. And over to you, Professor Desai, thanks. You know, it's an interesting and a difficult question, okay? Um, I would not say that revolutionary changes haven't happened. Uh, education is one area in which we have seen a revolutionary growth uh, of women's education and decline in gender inequality in education. 
At the same time, there are many other areas where we haven't seen any changes. Okay, and I think that, that there has to be a prioritization of where we can act. Certain things. So, for example, uh, changing social norms is something that is quite difficult to do. Okay, uh, at the same time, creating opportunities is much easier to do. Okay, so for example, uh, some of the most interesting initiatives uh, that we see around is in places like Indian Institute of Technology and engineering colleges, where we can increase the enrollment by girls. Okay, um, that in itself may make a difference in terms of sort of occupational seg segregation. So finding ways of where you can make practically changes, uh, not necessarily in sort of a, trying to change social norms or culture, but rather creating opportunities and removing barriers. The second area where barriers have been identified and become particularly pertinent are things like uh, physical safety around in public spaces. Okay, uh, we have focused so much on domestic violence, but we haven't paid sufficient attention to creating um, spaces where physical safety can be announced. And yet it has been shown that it's associated with women's labor force participation. There are also interesting studies which tell you how to do it, you know, building uh, uh, shining lights on bus stations. Okay, that's one of the easiest thing to do. Okay, so it is, I think the trick is to think about whatever research tells us uh, in terms of where the uh, impact can be made and then focusing on practical strategies uh, out of that, which is achievable, doable, okay, is where I would like to see as well. Thank you, thank you, Professor Desai. I really hear that point, especially research, do it and then get the insights, use it. And then we usually talk policy, but you're also saying use it practically for practical actions, which is which is very, very powerful. Okay, so I have a question now from Yagya Karki, which is about calculating demographic dividend. So is there anything more to the question, Yagya, if you want to just come in and ask? Otherwise, then I would ask both of our professors to give us a bit of a technical uh, response to uh, that question. I'll just wait for a second if Yagya, you want to come in and ask. But I'm just checking, uh, can people ask questions or does it have to be through that? Yeah, that's not a problem. Okay, Yagya, can you hear us? Okay, uh, probably not. Okay, in that case, is that a sufficient enough question, Professor Kulkarni? Uh, Professor yes. Professor Kulkarni first. Uh, okay, uh, all right, am I, I on? I yeah. that question. Where might it be? I'll, I'll read it for you. So just a second, it disappeared from my screen also. It was about, I can't see it now. It was about the method of calculating demographic dividend. I wonder about the method of calculating demographic dividend. That's all it says. Okay, okay Professor Kulkarni, do you want to? Yeah, okay, yes, okay. And then Professor Desai. Uh, uh, see, broadly, one can say dividend accrues when the share of working age population in a country or in, a, in an economy is high. But the question is, what is high? Now, there have been different uh, analysts have used different ways. One of these very commonly done is if this share of working age population increases, there is a positive growth in it, then we can say dividend accrues. If it declines, then we can say there is no longer dividend. Dividend is no longer, the window is closed. Now I have a small uh, difference of opinion on this or different assessment. My point is slightly different, which I made in the slide earlier, I mentioned that if the share of working age population is higher than normal, we could say there is dividend. So we are better off than normal. And that normal I used as the stationary population with that level of mortality. So the way I computed it is for this age group, 20 to 64, when the more life expectancy is between 70 and 80, as 
it is in India now, or India will go through this range for many years now. About 57% of the population would be in working ages, in a stationary population. But we are not stationary, we are destabilized. And in fact, the dividend accrues because population is destabilized. Fertility declines sharply. And therefore, if this share is more than 57%, we can say we are better off than normal and dividend accrues. So that is how I have looked at dividend. But there are different ways. Uh, there are more, so more sophisticated, more refined ways of looking at potential support ratio. You can have basically weighted consumption and weighted production. Uh, in fact, the chart shown earlier was about pro consumption and production by age. So age weighted consumption and production, and we can use a potential support ratio for that purpose. So there are different ways of looking at these things. And second thing is how much how much are you away from this cutoff? That is something, as I've shown in one of the graphs, China, in China, dependency ratio went down to as low as 51%, which means the dividend was very high at that time. In India, it would not go below 60%. So India would not get such a high dividend at any point. So this is broadly how I look at it, but there are other ways of looking at it. Thank you, Professor Kulkani. Thanks so much. Professor Desai, did you want to come back or have any other comment on this one? Uh, no, I think Professor Kulkarni has answered the technical aspect of it very well. I think part of it also that plays into it is uh, using some of the national transfer accounts methodology, which is depends on age specific uh, profile of consumption and production. Okay. And I think uh, uh, Nandita actually made a very good point on that one, that your age specific uh, profile of uh, consumption and production also depends upon uh, the age at which um, uh, age until which uh, individual is able to continue working. Okay. And so that to what extent can we sort of exp uh, expand the productivity into older ages? And I suppose to what extent um, uh, the childhood is expanded because of uh, higher investments in education. Okay? So in some sense, um, it, it's the balance between age specific uh, uh, profile of consumption and production and then proportion of population that would make a difference. Okay? Um, I, I would say that on a sort of a more of a generalized level, I would really like us to focus not specifically on um, a proportion of working age population rather than proportion of workers. And that sort of plays into all kinds of things, you know, uh, youth unemployment rates, um, uh, elderly employment opportunities and female employment opportunities. I think those would be some of the crucial things for us to sort of think about. Um, I also see there are some, um, there is another question. Yes, on... yes, please go ahead if you're able to see it. I was just looking at that from Angad Singh, uh, especially to you, Professor Desai. Um, I, you know, it, 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 this, this is a very interesting question and I'm going to twist it a little bit. Okay, the question basically asks that there is a lack of teacher and facility uh, in uh, some of the government schools. Okay. And there are other schools, more privileged ones, there are all kinds of uh, technical facilities available. And how far will be the competition between the children? Okay. I, I, I think this is a really important question. And again, I'm sorry, I keep coming back to the pandemic because this is what we are all living through and our mindsets are sort of around it. Okay. Um, a pandemic has actually seen aggravation of inequality uh, between children based on access to technologies uh, and access to internet, um, sophistication in dealing with technology and so on. And so in some sense, we clearly have tremendous inequality in education. Um, in, even for children completing class three, you can see children in you know, modern school in Delhi would be doing very differently from children in uh, a rural school in Mandala district. Okay? That said, I think demographic dividend has a, a very interesting relationship here because more of your children are going to be coming from these disadvantaged districts and from these disadvantaged families because these are the districts and families with higher fertility. Okay. 
Okay. So if we want to take advantage of demographic dividend is above and beyond normal equality conversation, it's really about sort of, you know, uh, practical efficiency issues that we must sort of focus on people at the bottom of the pyramid rather than at the top of the pyramid, because without sort of including them, there is no way of really reaping uh, the demo demographic dividend. I hope that answers. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Um, just checking with the audience, thank you, uh, Professor Desai. If there are any other questions people have put in the chat bar, there's a new message. Yeah, that's a thanks. That's well answered, thank you. Uh, yes, very much. I think this is a great comment, Professor Desai, which you have kind of uh, catalyzed the thinking that how the pandemic has aggravated inequalities, and that's that's really well taken. Um, yeah, I'm just waiting to see if there are any other further. Uh, Jay, if you don't please. see any other thing, may I can just come in? Uh, please, please, Ram, come in. Why don't you or something? You know, yeah. I mean, I know well, that we have these experts. Yeah. I don't want to kind of miss this opportunity as well. Yes, uh, I, I mean, we we heard that. Uh, I mean, Professor Kulkarni kind of uh, classified the demographic window, you know, into four phases. Uh, you know, you have then states like Kerala um, and Tamil Nadu, where the window has already closed or is closing. Uh, is there something that, you know, I mean, these states could do? Uh, because, I mean, I do understand that, you know, I mean, based on our estimate, uh, the north central region uh, is already or will soon be the kind of the reservoir for India's workforce. You know, uh, so more and more people will kind of migrate uh, to the southern state. But then uh, maybe uh, sometimes when I speak to some of those policymakers from southern states, there seems to be kind of an apprehension saying that, you know, oh, now we are getting kind of invaded. Uh, you know, uh, the balance is going to uh, change. The, the, the culture is kind of under attack. Is that a valid concern or is it like, you know, uh, so how can these states kind of address uh, those? Any, any, any thoughts on that? Well, um, as a Gujarati in Delhi, I think that, uh, you know, interstate uh, migration is a way of life, okay? But that said, I actually want to make my favorite pitch, okay? Why is it that we don't think in terms of expanding existing workforce uh, when you have, you know, a very large chunk of appropriate age population out of labor force, namely women of those states? Okay. So I, it seems to me that Kerala and Tamil Nadu are the ones where we need to work hardest on expanding employment for women, okay? uh, since those are the uh, states where some of these challenges uh, seem to be emerging the most. But the second part of it also is that this may actually be an appropriate time for us to think about raising the retirement age. Okay? You know, as the life expectancy expands, the idea that someone is old at age 60 seems uh, sort of uh, inconceivable, uh, particularly to some of us which are, uh, who are reaching some of those sensitive ages. Okay? And so it seems to me that uh, actually harnessing the contributions of older generation okay? by expanding um, age at retirement, uh, by creating sort of opportunities for them to participate in the labor force in perhaps different ways, might be another thing that would be a very worthwhile thing to do. Sure, sure. Ram, did you have any further comments? No, no. I mean, I mean, I mean, great. Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, uh, Professor Nandu. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. There's one comment that I want to chip in here, uh, particularly that we are hearing. Uh, you know, this is a little complicated. Let me put it across what I'm taking away. I think what you both said was very interesting that the demographic dividend so far has been looked at from the angle of youth and advantage, but not from the angle of how do we address the inequality question going beyond. And what you seem to be saying, Professor Desai, is that's it. It's in everybody's interest to address the bottom of the pyramid. If you want to get the best dividend out of this, this kind of inverting the logic so far, and it's a new way of looking at inequality is what I'm taking away. Is that, is that correct? 
at least that's what it seems to me that we should be doing. After all, next generation of workers are going to come out of some of these more disadvantaged families okay, and disadvantaged regions. And so addressing inequality is necessary, not just because it's you know, a, a, a good thing to do, okay, but it's also because it's an efficient thing to do. Okay? And you know, focusing particularly on young people and their skill building. Okay? Uh, you know, one of the things that I have sort of uh, been uh, found is very interesting. We have been looking at uh, children uh, who were mm, 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 age uh, eight to 11 at one point in time, and they had become teenager when we did the second round of our survey. What we found was very interesting. Look, six-year-olds as parents, we all know that some of them are good learners and some of them are poor learners. Okay, um, but when children come from middle class, uh, if you are poor learners at age six, seven, eight, their parents will find ways by which, by golly, they are going to learn and they're going to get to college. Okay, when the children uh, who are poor learners from poor sections of society, okay, uh, they, they sort of tend to fall behind. So what we have is a middle class safety net. And it just seems to me that if we are going to address inequality, what's important is to target particular ages uh, and learning inequalities are greatest at, you know, uh, from age about three to 10, okay? And I think that's where we should be focusing our attention, okay? That's where you fall behind, you fall behind. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's very, very important, I think. So uh, questions are coming still, so which is great. Uh, here is a question. How fair is it to increase retirement age in India without affecting opportunities for younger working people? How can it be balanced? I think that addresses uh, is addressed to both of you, actually. You touched upon it. So I don't know, Professor Kulkarni, you first, and then Professor Desai. Uh, thank you. Actually, you know, this is the issue that comes in. And in fact, as uh, some of the question raised by Nandita earlier and so on, as life expectancy increases, age at retirement should also increase, at least as happened in European countries. Now, if we go by that, we should have high age, higher age at retirement in Kerala than in the other states, but that is not actually true. So people have not responded to it for the reason that the question really brought in, that if you age, raise age at retirement, Will that increase unemployment, especially reduce opportunities for the young? And this is always a question. So there is this kind of a conflict and one has to resolve it basically by, you know, and overall employment has to increase. So we cannot just say, okay, reduce age at retirement to provide more opportunities or raise at a, age at retirement and reduce the opportunities for the entrant. So overall employment has to be exceeded and age at retirement has to be increased as, health conditions improve. And in fact, that is something that would provide us to add to production. This is what has happened in European countries. Uh, I totally sure, agree. Sure, yes. Yeah, I think that if we are worrying about declining demographic dividend in some of the Southern countries, okay, this is one way of increasing the demographic dividend or at least reducing dependency ratio. Um, and I would, say that you know it, it's a slow increase in retirement age just as there is a slow increase in age at which children uh, young people are joining the labor force right because where people used to start working at age 15 now they kind of go through college and they are working at an older and older ages particularly in high education states like kerala okay so those are the states where actually we might start thinking about adjusting retirement age at um, earlier than in other, other states. Sure, sure. Thank you. We are, we are drawing close. I think this is, this is a very rich discussion that's happening. Um, I, I want to say, unless there are any other questions, maybe we'll just go for um, a final round of comments from you. But I did want to say we are getting good takeaways and I'm sure we, we will look at this recording and there are you know, various kinds of actions being proposed by you, by this eminent panel of uh, yours, uh, of ours. And we've had some good questions. So thank you all very much for that. Uh, I'm hearing, let's take a family-based approach. Let's take a time-bound, age-specific. 
um, sort of uh, actions. Let's do NTA at the country and state level, update ourselves, uh, and, and various other comments that have come. And really, they are very, very useful. Uh, when Ram started off saying we are looking at this in a very practical way, I think uh, this is really helping us take it forward. So I would like to say thanks to the audience who have been uh, hearing us, uh, hearing all of you. I've been asking questions. I hope that was useful. And I would really like to thank you, uh, my panelists. You've been superb, you know, especially giving us very clear insights and keeping to time as well. So thank you very much. I really would like you to finish with some final comments and bites. Uh, so over to you, Ram, first, and then to you, Professor Kulkarni, and then we'll finish with you, Professor Desai. Ram. Thanks, thanks, uh, Jay. I mean, let me start by thanking our esteemed uh, panelists. I'm here as a participant, you know, I'm just to listen and learn uh, as well. So it's been, it's been, I mean, really great. Uh, just in my final comments, I mean, what I'm taking is that, you know, the population size alone cannot tell the whole story. Uh, we know that a country can have a very small population and still be very poor or have a large population and be equally poor. You know, so rather it is the policies uh, tailored to the specific demographic context uh, and, and then concerted investment made towards uh, quality education and health, uh, you know, including sexual and reproductive health. Uh, uh, they are the ones that leave a greater impact. Uh, so uh, as the full potential of every girl and every boy is unleashed, then and only then, uh, including the marginalized population, uh, Professor Sonal, they talked about, uh, will a country attain the much dreamed of future where no one is left behind, and then only the country can reap the uh, demographic dividend. Uh, so I'll just stop at that. Thanks. Thanks, Ram. Thank you. Professor Kulkarni, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to say something closing, as you said, you know, during the last century, especially in second half of the last century coming into this century. Often the principal issue talked about population was population growth, often called population explosion, population bomb, and so on, the neo-Malthusian kind of thing. But in the 21st century, that's not going to be the major issue because population explosion is not going to be there. We Population control, quote unquote, whatever you say, is already there, you can say. And many projections say, population will reach a peak and then decline, no doubling in future, at least in, the, in this century. But the issue that is going to be there and that would be massive issue is of migration, migration of state to states because of growth imbalances. As Sridham just mentioned earlier, there is often resistance to migrants. You know, why are the people coming here? Be locals, outsiders, sons of soils, not People are not saying yet daughters of soil, but sons of soils and others coming in, intruders, invaders, whatever. And this is something that is there. So in addition to providing support to migrants, one must also have policies which would address broad society as well as the polity to see that yes, migration is part of life. Migration is part of economic development. And we must cater to that. We must make it smooth without bringing in the issues of locals, outsiders who are coming and who are coming. And that would require adjustments from both migrants as well as non-migrants and a consensus among the, in the society and among the political parties. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kulkarni. Professor Desai. Uh, thank you, Professor Kulkarni. I actually want to just amplify a point you made in your presentation. Uh, which is about data. We are all demographers on this forum. Um, so, uh, the only currency we have uh, in terms of affecting public policy is through data uh, and identification of you know, where um, there is a policy leverage possible, where policies are working, where they are not working. Okay? And um, ensuring that we sort of advocate for appropriate data to be able to do this kind of analysis uh, in sort of just a broad recording of what's happening in society is very important. And I think that this is where or, uh, you know, institutions like UNFPA are best placed uh, in terms of sort of making sure that we bring best practices from around the world and think about developing uh, a good database on which uh, policy discourse can take place. Uh, that's the only way to do it uh, in a non-partisan, uh, sensible manner. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Desai. I cannot not say this quotation I quite like that on data, they say, in God we trust, for everything else we need data. So thank you for reminding that. And since you mentioned data, I cannot not thank my colleague Sanjay, who has been such a crucial part of this discussion. So Sanjay, if you're on video, just uh, please uh, show yourself. You've been so crucial in this conversation, bringing it all together. And he's also our lead person on data. So I'd like to say thank you to Sanjay and all of you. Uh, it has been really fruitful. Uh, and thank you, Manan, for all the technical support. Uh, and thanks uh, to you, Professor Desai, Professor Kulkarni, uh, Sriram for joining, and everybody else in the audience. Thank you very much.